Are you recording? Oh, there we go. Holly Davidson. Yeah. Ed, uh, what kind of car do elves drive? Toy Otas or minivans. You got the minivan part. Yes. All right, let's pray. <laughs> Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. I pray that you would be in our midst, that you would uh, bless this time that we have together. And uh, we are so grateful that you brought us to, to another year. And Lord, I pray that we would finish this year well, that we would commit to serving you more deeply in the year ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I think I am going to have to lower this because I can't see Luke and Jade, and I, I like to make faces at them during the sermon. Let's see if that works. Oh, perfect. And now I can see you guys. Yay. <laughs> And past Christmas. So uh, Christmas Eve, who's coming to the candlelight service? Four o'clock, four to five. Okay, and we have some others. So it'll be a great time. I love this time of the year. Isaiah is one of the prophets who prophesied about this time of the year. And in chapter nine, starting at verse six, he said, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. Why did Jews reject Jesus Christ when he first came? Because that didn't happen. The government did not rest on his shoulders. He was a suffering servant. He didn't lead anybody but a ragtag group of 12 guys and maybe 130 disciples. And no one else really believed him. They didn't know, and they crucified him. Because he didn't throw off Roman rule. Tonight, you can see the menorah up here. Uh, we begin Hanukkah. And Jews all over the world will celebrate this feast. It's important to note that Jesus chose this feast to reveal himself as the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? Okay, Hanukkah is a powerful feast, and we're going to talk about it a little bit today. But he's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, or literally Father of Eternity, or we should say Creator, or the one who gave birth to eternity. Who created all things? Jesus Christ. Yeah, so he is not the Father, God the Father, but he is the Father of eternity. He did create all things. Uh, uh, mighty God, and he is part of the Godhead. There will be no end to the increase of his government or peace. That didn't happen at his first coming. It will happen at his second. So this is why Jews rejected Jesus Christ. They went to this prophecy and they said, well, literally, that didn't happen. He can't be a Messiah. Can we blame him? Absolutely, because other prophecies said he would come and die. Daniel said he'll come, he'll die, he'll be cut off and have nothing. Uh, later on in Isaiah, it says, man, he's going to be crucified for our iniquities. He's going to go to the cross for our sins and all of that. But that's why he came. Luke chapter 1, 32 and 33 says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever, and his kingdom will have no end. Was that fulfilled at his first coming? No. And even Jews can point to our own verses and say, but he didn't do that. But he will do that. Are you with me? Okay. Oh, yeah. So we have to go to all the other verses, and there's tons that say he's going to come and die. He's going to come as a suffering servant, and uh, then another coming, he's going to come as the victorious king of kings and lord of lords. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you just go to the rest of the prophecies. And we find the two comings of Messiah very clearly articulated, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is great. Um, all right, so uh, Luke 2, 1. Now, uh, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Real guy or, or phony? Hey, real guy. We have proof that he existed. We know when he existed. Um, <clears throat> that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth, and this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. We know he was governor twice, and we know last year we went through all the proof of exactly when this was. Who remembers what year was Christ born based on Quirinius' census? 
8 BC. 8 BC. Now, not very many scholars agree with that date. Many will say 4 BC or 5 BC, but there simply was not a census taken by Quirinius at those times. And we know that Herod died, what, 4 BC? So Christ had to have been born at least two years before Herod, which would place it at 6 BC. And there definitely wasn't a Quirinius census taken there, but we can prove huh, that there was a census about 8 BC. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. And we know that Joseph and Mary were headed to Bethlehem because Jesus had to be born there okay, to fulfill prophecy. We must always remember that the Bible is actual history. It is not fanciful, uh, storyful events. It's not uh, uh, made-up stories like Zeus and uh, Santa Claus and elves and all of that. It's a real story. In fact, Justin Martyr wrote about this census, and when he lived, you could still go to Rome and pull up that census and read it. Just as Martyr wrote right in, in the middle of the second century, said that in his own day, more than 100 years after the time of Jesus, you could still look up the registers of the census that Luke mentioned. What happened after that? Hey, the emperor of Rome wanted Christianity fully erased from, from history. So they burned all the records, and we have a record of that as well. So, wow, all of that. So, anyway, while Joseph and Mary were there, shepherds in the field saw an angel of the Lord, Luke chapter 2. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for the peoples. For today in the city of David, there has been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, or peace what? To all men? No, peace to whom? To who? People who he is pleased with. Not everybody, right? Okay. And we know that uh, the world, though, tries to say peace to all men, and even compromised Christians, neo-orthodoxy, talk to Scott about that. Peace for men in whom the Lord is pleased. So as we end 2019, I want to ask you a question, and I always reflect on the past year. Have I lived a life pleasing to the Lord? You know, we're about to finish a year, and thank God we get a whole fresh start in 2020. By the way, I can't believe we have reached the year 2020. When I was in high school, that was like future. That was like science fiction. You know, it was like, heck, space, what, Odyssey 2001 or whatever came out. We thought that was science fiction, 2001. Now it's 2020. We thought we were going to be like the Jetsons. This year, you know, flying around in our cars. But we are almost getting self-driving vehicles. We're doing a lot of stuff. You can ask your phone any question like a Star Trek communicator, and it'll tell you the answer. She's wrong half the time, though. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> they need to fix her, I think. Uh, anyway, so as we end 2019, we really need to consider, have I lived a life pleasing to the Lord? And if not, what do I need to do differently? Now, for me, I know this year, and I say this every year, but I, I want to get in shape physically, spiritually, emotionally, in all ways, because I have let myself go to pot, you know, physically. Spiritually, I've been close to the Lord. That's great. But physically, you know, I, I think, should we not be good stewards even over this temple and our bodies? Yeah, we should try to uh, live healthy lives. So there's some changes I need to make. Do I call them New Year resolutions? Uh, you could. Uh, most people break those. But how about just new resolve to be a better you in 2020? And to live a life pleasing to the Lord, because that's who he's going to bless. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid or fearful. The greatest gift that God can give us this Christmas season is peace. 
You know, every drug addict, every alcoholic, and every man or woman involved in illicit affairs, it's because they do not have peace and joy in the situation they find themselves in, and they're looking for a way out. Are you with me? If you could have real peace, wouldn't that be worth everything? You know, I minister to some wealthy people and some people on welfare that can't even afford anything on their deathbeds, and there's no difference. In fact, i got to tell you, some of the poorest people that I've ministered to have the most peace, and some of the wealthiest people that I minister to are in the most agony. Isn't that weird? Why do you think that is? Because peace can't be bought. <laughs> You can't serve God and money, man. Right, amen. So, I mean, the ultimate gift is salvation, but that is how we get our peace, and we need that. First John 2, 1, Jesus said, or John wrote, My little children, I'm writing to you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate, an attorney. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> it's a good profession. Uh, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Next time someone asks, just say, you know, my Lord and Savior, not only was he a Jewish carpenter, but he is a, a Jewish attorney. And he's, you know, making intercession right now. Verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation. What's that theological term? Payment. Payment. Yeah, he paid for our sins, not ours only, but those of who? The whole world. Folks, it's not limited atonement. Jesus paid for everyone's sin. He paid on the cross for every sin you will ever commit. And don't let the enemy lie to you as we come to the end of this year. And when I ask that question, have you lived a life pleasing to God? Because all of us can say, part of the time, but part of the time I didn't. Does that make sense? And what, what's the ones that always weigh heaviest on our heart? I don't know about you, it's the times I didn't. I rather than please God, and that guilt robs me of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the enemy at the end of this year, when I ask that question, you should immediately say, I am cleansed by the blood of Christ, and all of the mistakes I made in 2019 are gone. Jesus doesn't remember them. God doesn't remember them. They are as far as the east is from the west. I am cleansed. I am forgiven. So, yes. I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore I lived a life pleasing to God in 2019. But there are things that we need to change. Amen? But don't let the condemnation of the enemy rob you of your peace. Does that make sense? Because Jesus paid for all our sin on the cross. But we all fail God, and that's why God tells us in Isaiah 53, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of of us all to fall on Jesus, to fall on the Messiah, he will die. And you can bring him to Isaiah 53. In fact, if you read it, most Jews will say, that's in the New Testament. That's not in the Old Testament. No, that, it, well, they do, rab some rabbis, it's, it's conflicted, you know. But uh, especially since we got the Dead Sea Scrolls. I got to tell you, let me, let me give you the new argument. Okay, we got the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1948. We found them into the uh, 1960s. The whole scroll of Isaiah was there. It was over a 1,000 years older than our oldest copy of Isaiah, which some rabbis said Christians added that. Are you with me? They added that to Isaiah to make it look like Jesus. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls proved them wrong because they were a thousand years older, long before there was any disciples of Christ. And that prophecy was in that school. So now rabbis cannot deny it. They can't. But they will allegorize it, and just like we have neo-Orthodox Christians today, Scott, what do they say? God doesn't demand uh, judgment. God doesn't j demand blood sacrifice. None of the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament did God ever command them to do it. They were ugly, bloodthirsty people, and God did not require Jesus to die on the cross. That's what new Christians were saying. Where did they get that? Well, Satan. Doctrines of demons. <laughs> they say God is love, and so therefore he would never require blood sacrifice. 
That's Satan's conclusion. They are, the Bible says in the last days men will pay attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. That is a doctrine of demons. But the idea is they will justify what they want to believe. Regardless, even though now with the Dead Sea Scrolls we have proof that Isaiah 53 was part of the school of Isaiah long before any notion of a suffering servant Christ. You know, it was a prophecy and wow, it's, it's amazing. All right. Aren't you glad, though, the iniquity of us all fell on Christ? He paid for our sins. If there's one thing I want to remind people out there is that no matter, because there's a lot of people I minister to on their deathbed, and they're like, I failed too much. There's no way God can love me. And I say, man, Jesus is capable of taking on all your sin, and he loves you, and I remind them of this. And sometimes they weep and feel released from the condemnation. And we go to Romans 8. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? All right. So uh, tonight starts the Feast of Lights. Hanukkah. Hanukkah is Hebrew. It's a Hebrew word, Hanukkah. And this is the proper spelling. But some rabbis spell it, what, C-H-A. But that's actually... This menorah is not called the menorah. Menorah is literally how many, uh, in, in the temple, how many uh, candlestick holders were there? Seven. Okay, the menorah in the temple, the candlestick, there's seven. This has eight. They added the eighth one, the last one, because um, for eight days, God supernaturally let the candlestick in the temple stay lit. Uh, this one is called a shaman, shamas, and it literally means a servant. And it represents, folks, Jesus Christ. And on some, it's higher, and on some, it's lower. And remember the prophecy, he made him a little lower than the angels, but will exalt him higher. So it's all prophecy pointing to Jesus Christ, the suffering servant who literally lights all the other ones. So in the, in the actual temple, this last thing would not be there. It would just be the six and then the shamas, the servant one in the back. So seven candlesticks in the, in the actual temple. But there's... Well, they don't, they don't call it Jesus Christ. They just call it the shamas, the servant candle. Um, but Christ is the servant. It so points to Christ. They will see that. When they finally figure it out, they're like, oh my goodness, even Hanukkah, when we lit the candles, it all pointed to Jesus Christ. They, oh, it's going to be so beautiful. It also means Hanukkah in the Hebrew to rededicate. This season is a season of rededicating ourselves, our homes, everything to the Lord. Amen? And we know the story. I'm going to get into it. It's all about light. It's about Jesus becoming light. And by the way, Hanukkah starts tonight at sunset. Do you guys have menorahs? For some okay. If not, light a candle. Uh, it's it's really cool. It's about oil as well. God supernaturally they had enough oil for one day when they took back the temple from Antiochus Epiphanes, and they consecrated the temple back to the Lord. The only oil that they could use they had enough for one day, and God made it supernaturally last for eight days. And so they added that for the menorah candle to recognize the eight days. It's the extra oil we need to shine bright. And the parable of the ten virgins, folks, again, is about extra oil. And the five wise virgins who were ready to wait till the midnight hour had the extra oil. The five foolish didn't. And so Hanukkah is about getting the extra oil that God provides. It's about faith and courage, how the Maccabees, literally a ragtag group of people, uh, convinced some of the Jews to fight with them over the Seleucid, the Syrian, and Greek armies, and they won supernaturally and threw off their rule. Hanukkah um, is really all about Jesus. So Antiochus Epiphanes, Epiphanes means God incarnate. So he is a type of Antichrist, and, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But he was the Grecian Syrian king. He had taken over Israel in the Temple Mount. He was trying to convert all the Jews to uh, worship Zeus and the Greek gods. He set up an image of Zeus in the temple. He sacrificed pigs on the altar. Sounds like the abomination of desolation, doesn't it? 
Okay, it's pretty interesting how he is a type of Antichrist. And First Maccabees, and this is where we get this story, it's part of our apocrypha, our apocryphal literature. Uh, Maccabees was originally written probably about 100 B.C., and it begins with the reign of Antiochus IV in 175 B.C., the rebellion of Matthias in 167 B.C., the murder of his son Simon in 135 B.C., and it talks about all of that. So the feast literally... Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes came in, took over the Temple Mount, we're not going to read all of that, uh, and set up an image of Zeus in the temple where the Jews would worship God. So Antiochus Epiphanes decided to force Jews to give up their religion and start worshiping the Greek gods. He killed 40,000 Jews, enslaved about uh, 40,000 others, he desecrated the temple. He set up an abomination of desolation, an idol in the temple uh, of Zeus. He sacrificed pigs on the altar. So he did exactly what the Antichrist will do, except one thing. Antiochus said, worship the gods of Greece, Zeus and the other gods. What will the Antichrist do? Worship me. I am the God. Even though Epiphanes means God incarnate, they actually called him a, a wordplay, a pitpanes, which means crazy one. <laughs> well, it's a type of the Antichrist, and so oftentimes we have double fulfillment for our learning. So we need to study this because if we're going to be here when the Antichrist takes power, some of the things that Antiochus did probably will be employed as we go into the last days. Um, he also forced people to not observe the, the Sabbath, to not do temple sacrifices. Thus, he desecrated the altar with pigs and all of that. Uh, he was a type of Antichrist. He reigned over the Jews for 3.5 years. How long will the Antichrist reign over the Jews? 3.5 years. Kind of interesting. All just a type for our instruction. Um, a lot of Book of Daniel talk about Tychus Epiphanes and what he was going to do when Daniel wrote the prophecy, and then he did it, uh, but it was only a shadow or a type because Daniel gets more into the Antichrist who will exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship, which he did, uh, Antiochus didn't. Um, one Jewish man, Matthias, and his five sons, Judah, Jonathan, Simeon, or Simon, uh, and grandchildren, they nicknamed him Maccabee, thus the title of the book Maccabees, which means hammer or hammers because they became the hammer of the Lord. They threw off Antiochus's rule. They cleansed the temple mount. Uh, it was amazing. Their whole military campaign was supernatural, except one day they lost the battle. It was on the Sabbath, and they refused to fight. Think about that. They were such devout Jews that they would not even fight on the Sabbath. So a 1,000 men, women and, women, and children were killed that day. But they eventually won. They cleansed the temple. There wasn't enough oil in the lamp, but God supernaturally had the lamp in the temple stay lit for eight days. And thus began the Feast of Lights, the Feast of Dedication, dedicating the temple back to the Lord, or Hanukkah, which we celebrate today. So why are we talking about Hanukkah? It's relevant to every Christian. God broke through 250 years of silence to assure the faithful that he was pleased with them and that he was with them. I want you to consider that. God had not spoken to the nation of Israel for 250 years until he supernaturally made the lamp stay lit for eight days. What do we call them? The 400 silent years. So another 150 years are left before uh, Zacharias comes, the father of John, and the angel of the Lord speaks to him. So literally there were 400 silent years except for this one event, the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah. God broke through and spoke to them, kind of to tap them on the shoulder. You know what I mean? Has God ever done that to you? You feel abandoned by God. You feel like, where is the Lord? You read the word and it doesn't come alive like it used to. You pray and you don't feel the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you and giving you any insight. You're abandoned. The light, the oil, the rededication of the temple is a type of our Christian walk today, as we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
We have the oil, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that fills us and lights us. Who now is the light of the world? We are. Jesus said, while I'm here, I'm the light of the world. But I go to the Father. Now, Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. You appear as lights in the midst of a perverse and dark generation. It's the oil of the Holy Spirit that lights our lamps. This morning, God wants to do a miracle in your life. I really believe that. I think Hanukkah is an awesome opportunity for us to kind of end the year right, rededicating ourselves to the Lord, preparing for 2020 with a new love for our spouse, with a new commitment to our families, and with a new commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? As the temple of the Holy Spirit, to be offered completely to him, like the Maccabees did. They, they, by the way, they should not have won that war, but they did, and it was supernatural. What about lighting the menorah? What did it look like? Thankfully, thanks to Rome, we know exactly what the menorah looked like. Uh, and so that is the Arch of Titus. Titus, in 70 AD, went and wiped out Jerusalem, and they carried all the temple artifacts back to Rome. This was to commemorate Titus's victory over that and on that arch right in there we have some of them carrying the articles and look at that right there there it is there it is and that's what it looks like that was made out of solid gold think about that probably worth some money uh, and and could be wood overlaid on the base but these were solid gold uh, Thanks. So it had to have been heavy. Uh, but that's exactly what it looks like. I am so blessed that they did that. Because we could have guessed what it looked like, but now we know exactly what it looks like. And so the nation of Israel actually adopted that as their uh, seal. Um, and it's the exact menorah. It all points to Jesus Christ and the church. What is the Jewish seal today points to the church of Jesus Christ, which is amazing. I love it. The church is that lampstand. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, that's the menorah. So when it says the seven golden lampstands, it could be seven of these with the seven there, but there's seven here. So it could be just this one, but he walked amidst them. So theoretically, there is more than, uh, there are seven golden lampstands, and the golden lampstand are all seven of these. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. It all points to Christ and the church. Even Hanukkah. We are lights on that lampstand now, Matthew 5.14. You are the light of the world. The city on the hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a bushel or a basket, but on a lampstand so it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Interesting. How do you shine your light? By what? Good works. Hey, love your neighbor as yourself. Some people, who was it, St. Francis of Assisi said, uh, hey, share the gospel, and if necessary, use words. I think both are true, because you can be the most loving neighbor, but if you don't tell them, I am so loving because of Christ in me, you can be a Buddhist and be a loving neighbor, or a Mormon and be a loving neighbor. You need to let them know it's because of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in you that uh, you can do those good works. Christ is walking in our midst. I love this, Revelation 2, when the angel uh, of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, Jesus Christ, is with us in our services, participating through the agency of the Holy Spirit. This is our time to shine by the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9 says, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. That oil of gladness is a reference to the fruit of the Holy Spirit, 
love, joy, peace, patience. The joy of the Lord is our strength, right? The Holy Spirit, this time of the year, we need to rekindle that flame that's in our hearts, that Holy Spirit anointing. It makes us strong and able to stand for truth, to not compromise, and it gives us discernment, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, so we can recognize truth and falsehood. And believe me, there is a lot of falsehood being articulated from pulpits today all over the world. We need to be so careful. And it empowers us for living, and it produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So the blessings and miracle of rededication or Hanukkah is important. After all these silent years, God break through and kind of tapped him on the shoulder and said, man, I'm still with you. And if you feel like God has abandoned in you, believe me, he's not. It's at this time of dedication that we celebrate this and rekindle our love for God and our connection with God. Amen? All right. So uh, tonight is Hanukkah. Uh, it starts at sunset, and you write the candles like Hebrew from the right to the left. Uh, so Hebrew goes backwards, not the way we write left to right, but right to left. So the first candle tonight will go in the very right, and the uh, shamas, the servant candle, will be in the back. Those are the only two you'll light tonight. So you light the shamas. You use the shamas to light the other ones. Then tomorrow night you'll light the two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, to the eighth, ninth, and then you light all the candles. Now, why should we do that? Why should Christians celebrate any of the Jewish feasts at all? Because you said they all point to Christ. How do they do that? Again? Because in the Bible, those are the only feasts we we're given. We're never told to celebrate Christmas or Easter. But we are told to celebrate Passover. We are told to, to celebrate Hanukkah. We are told that as a Jew. Yeah, no, we're told it too. Yeah, Paul says celebrate the feast uh, when he talks about it. So Jesus reveals himself as the Christ on this feast. You can turn to John chapter 10 if you want. Uh, the verses are up here. At the time of the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. And the Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So the Jews were hoping he was the Christ. In fact, they knew he was fulfilling all the prophecies that Christ would fulfill. The Pharisees were not stupid. The Sadducees were not dumb people. They were learned men. They knew, okay, born in Bethlehem, right? Okay, remember when the Magi came to visit this child, and he went to the king and said, where is he? And the king, Herod, said, hey, where will Christ be born? And the scholar said, in Bethlehem. So king Herod said, hey, in Bethlehem, and when you find him, come back and tell me that I might worship him. But what did Herod want to do? He wanted to kill him. So even, they knew, okay, he's born in Bethlehem, he's giving sight to the blind, he's healing those that are deaf, he's doing all these miracles, he's fulfilling literally all the prophecies, and right at Hanukkah, they come to him and say, don't keep us in suspense any longer, we know you're the Messiah. This is exactly what they were saying to him. We know you must be the Messiah, you're fulfilling everything. Don't keep us in suspense. If you are the Christ, please tell us plainly. And he did. But the uh, portico, Solomon's portico is right here. So this is the Holy of Holies in here. Uh, this is uh, the outer court. In there is where you would bring the sacrifices and all of that. And uh, Solomon's portico was over here. And Jesus was walking here. And, uh, and they confronted him. He said in that same chapter, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved to go out and find pasture. He also said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. He said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. And he said, chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are what? One. This is the first time he revealed it at Hanukkah. Is it important for us to celebrate Hanukkah? Yes, because light has come into the world. Folks, i got to tell you, 
the most biblical thing about December is Hanukkah, not Christmas. Christmas isn't even in the Bible. Hmm. All right. Christmas and Hanukkah both declare, though, that Jesus came, died, rose again, and gives light to those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to shine to a dark world. Amen? Hanukkah is the real uh, uh, winter feast, winter celebration. Yes. So, so Christmas uh, is probably when Christ was conceived. Uh, I believe he was born September, October, around Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, and we calculated that a couple of years ago when we looked at when um, uh, Mary went to stay with uh, the mother of John. What's her name? Elizabeth, yes, went to stay with Elizabeth. She was three months uh, pregnant already because we know exactly when Zechariah served as a priest and we figured that out. And so Mary would have been back. Christ would have been conceived in December around the 25th and born in September, October around Rosh Hashanah, uh, all of that. So you can calculate that um, pretty, pretty clearly. So tonight we light the menorah. It represents that light has come into the world. So, uh, by the way, December 25th, I still celebrate because now it is a Christian holiday. It's not a biblical holiday. Let me, so let me rephrase. It is a Christian holiday, but not a biblical holiday. Does it, can I say that? Same with Easter. Uh, e Easter is actually Passover. We should be celebrating Passover with the Jews because, and telling them it all points to Jesus. Uh, I have a few uh, Jewish people that... Are, uh, I minister to, right? And uh, they are secular Jewish people. Oh, we're Jew by birth, but so I, he said, I'm Jewish. You know? <laughs> um, and I, I'm talking about the feast, and I could see I was compelling them to be jealous because I'm like, I know Yahweh. I know your God. I worship him. I serve him. I have a incredible relationship with him. I celebrate Passover and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and I do it with my whole heart, and I brought in my uh, shofar and, you know, uh, all of this, and they were like, we want what you have. And I'm like, that's through Yeshua HaMashiach. That's through Jesus, your Messiah. I'm like, man, I touch you. You could be a descendant of David. I've studied you my whole life. You know, your people... And you nonchalantly say, well, I'm Jewish, whatever. It might have happened, it might not have. Who cares? Are you kidding? In fact, we're told that we should provoke them to jealousy that they might believe in Jesus Christ. How can we do it if we knock down their feasts that are perpetual feasts, the Bible says, an eternal covenant between me and my people? Are we God's people today? Guess what? We're part of that covenant. When people say, why do you celebrate Hanukkah and Passover? Because I'm commanded to. Because it provokes the Jews to jealousy. Because it leads people to Christ. And it breaks the old and the new all come together. And it all points to Jesus Christ. All of it. Wow. Now, I still celebrate Christmas and I still celebrate Easter. Those are great holidays, and I recognize Christmas as when, uh, man, Mary was impregnated. Uh, Jesus literally came as a developing, so it is when Christ came. He was a developing embryo in Mary's tummy December 25th. Wow, that's even more radical when you think about that. Creator of all things, who sustains all things, became a developing embryo in Mary's tummy? I can't even fathom that. Easter, I still celebrate the resurrection. Good Friday, you know I can't. Why? Why can't I celebrate Good Friday? Because Jesus said, I'll be in the earth three days and three nights. Friday night, Saturday night, oh, Sunday morning, that's only two nights. Yeah, it's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> it just didn't happen. Anyway, back to this. Remembering God's gift to us, giving our lives back to him, that's what Hanukkah and Christmas is all about. I pray this Christmas we would shine our lights bright. 
we would really rededicate, rekindle that fire. It's all about the oil and the fire. The wise virgins in the last days had the extra oil to endure till the midnight hour. Folks, that extra oil is the empowering of the Holy Spirit to remaining faithful to the light and truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's really a season of dedication and shining forth. That's why even Jews call it the Feast of Dedication and the Feast of Light. Everyone lighting lights, you know me, I always say, wow, thanks for putting lights on your house to celebrate the coming of light to this earth, Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. Man, it's so awesome you do that. And the tree, I always say, reminds us of the tree that Christ is going to eventually die on because he came to die. Wow. First Peter chapter 2, verse 25 says, For you were continually strained like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Isaiah 53 said the same thing. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. But the Lord... God the Father has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Messiah, Jesus. That's what it's really all about. 1 Peter 2.9, but you're a chosen race, a priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. I love this. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, it's so cool, and I don't know if we'll do it this uh, candlelight Christmas Eve because it'll still be light outside, but you turn all the lights off and you have one person with the candle. And then they light someone else's candle, and they light, all of a sudden the whole place is filled with light because each one is doing their little part, and it lights up the whole room. Wow, that's what we are. And lighting the menorah reminds us of that. How can we experience that light? And I know I use this verse a lot. Acts 2.42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's getting into the word of God. Fellowship, that's fellowshipping with one another. That's how you kindle each other. <clears throat> the breaking of bread and a prayer, and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Ever felt that awe? It's like, wow, Lord, whoa. Man, it's so awesome to be in your presence. You know, some of the rituals and feasts of the Old Testament, they all point to Jesus. And for some reason, especially with children, when you do that, you light the candle, and you gather around and say, God's people have been doing this for thousands of years. This is not some made-up thing. This is not men making up. This is a, a feast that God appointed to point us to God. I mean, it can be powerful. Everyone can feel that sense of awe. John 17, 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. You know, we read the word of God to know him, to live our lives in a way that pleases him. We're about to end 2019, and I hope we have clear vision in 2020. 2020 vision. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. No, no, no. I was actually going to serve it for the last, save it for the last Sunday of the month. But Pastor Chris was preaching that Sunday, so I had to throw it in there. Well, I have still have five minutes. Jesus came to die. Isaiah 53. Here's the one that we, we get, tell the Jews when they ask. Well, hey, he was supposed to come and be. Well, what about this? Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of the parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon it. him appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one whom men hid their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
and the chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. Wow. That's the Messiah who came, the first coming, to pay for our sins and reconcile us to God. To do away with temple sacrifice and to become the one sacrifice that we always go to, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb that was slain. Well, they used to say we probably added it. Somehow we snuck it. We got the only copies they had. Because remember, all their copies were burned when Rome took over the Temple Mount. They burned everything. Uh, all the emperors tried to get rid of all of that. And as Christianity continued to grow, by the way, Constantine didn't make Romans convert to Christianity. You know, under Constantine, all of Rome became a Christian nation. It was already almost totally Christian, and Constantine had no choice. So even though he said he had a vision of the cross in the sky and by this sign, go and conquer, and that's why he became a Christian, most of the people were already Christians. It had spread so rapidly. But when he made it the official religion of Rome, that's when it became compromised, and Roman Catholicism became more of a mix of paganism and other things. But in it, uh, who? Uh, 360 years? Christian. Yep. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, wow. Whew. All right. So, anyway, Christ came to give us peace. And I think I said in the beginning, you know, who does God give peace? The angels, they sing that song. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and good will to all men. No. Peace and good will to who? All men with whom he is well pleased. Ah, that's those that put their faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but when the Bible says, do this. This is a perpetual covenant between me and my people. Do you think God meant what he said? Isn't it weird that all these perpetual covenants we ignore, all the teachings of how to do church, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 through 1 Corinthians 14, that's all we've got. There's no other instruction on how to do church. Not one church obeys. 1 Corinthians 11 through 1 Corinthians 14. So we don't celebrate the feasts. We're not obedient to the only instruction in the Bible on, on how to do church. Whoa. Think the enemy's done a good job? Whoa. Not even living water. And I think I said a couple of weeks ago, man, read 1 Corinthians 11 through 14. Let's become a biblical church in 2020. Let's see. I mean, we're small enough. We might as well do it. I want to be faithful to the Lord and pleasing to the Lord. I love the Lord. I want to be obedient. So help me with that, folks. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 through 14. Let's become a real biblical church in 2020. Uh-oh, we're in trouble now. <laughs> oh, But we all fail God, and I know we're busy. Life is busy past six months, I've realized how busy life can be. <laughs> but I do know this. In the midst of it, you can have the peace and the joy of the Lord and the strength that only God provides. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Philippians chapter 4. Mm. And I use this verse a lot too, but so many people today say you don't have to repent. You ever talk to anyone like that? No, it's a whole movement in Christianity. No, you never have to repent. No, that's a sin to repent. But the Bible says, repent, turn back, that your sins may be forgiven, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I want that refreshing. This Christmas season, I want to have life abundantly in Christ. And he has set you free, free from guilt, free from depression, anxiety, fear, worry, all the chains of this world tries to pull you down, Christ has set you free. Don't live in the mire of this ugly world. Don't let 
the impeachment proceedings with Trump and all of that rob you of your joy. Don't let all the worldliness and all this stuff, we're strangers and aliens. This world is not our home. We're just passing through, and our citizenship is up there. But I do want Tesla's truck to hurry up and come out because I think that is the coolest truck ever. Russ is like, that's the ugliest truck I've ever seen. <laughs> Phew. Lord have mercy. Christmas, oh, uh, Cheryl had a mug. It says, uh, when the simple became the sacred. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not, that mug has it wrong. It's when God created the, all things, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, God the Son, the stainer of all things, the sacred became the simple. Ah, oh, wow. Man. That verse, you all know it, but it's true. He loves you so much. Don't let the enemy in 2020 rob you. Even though you fail God every day, run to the Lord. You are cleansed. You are forgiven. It is gone. He loves you. Press in to know the Lord. In 2020, let's do and be the best we can to be obedient to the word of God in all things. Amen? God bless you. Wise men indeed still seek him. And when you seek him, the Bible assures us that what? You will find him. Yep. When you knock, the door will be open. So let's get our family together each night for the next eight nights. Eight nights. Finishing well, right? Of 2019. We light a candle. If you don't have a menorah, just light a candle. It's, I mean, we don't have to be legalistic. Are you with me? Man, you light it and you say, wow, and you talk about the great story of God's provision and the oil, and that we're lights in a dark world. And you see all the dark stuff and ugly things people do? Because even little kids are watching the news. They're hearing about all the ugly shootings and all of that. We don't participate. We're light in a dark world. You might even turn the lights off. And then light, oh, isn't the light good? That's what Jesus is. And we're the light of the world. Oh, it's so beautiful. We need to shine forth eight days of rededication of supernatural provision from God of shining our light. We get our family together and we light the candle. I've got a handout for everybody that tells you essentially how to pray it in Hebrew and English. And uh, <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Uh, Scott, get your neighbors down there and light the menorah. So it's funny uh, that the Jews say you need to put it in a window so your neighbors see it. What are your neighbors going to do if they see you lighting a menorah in your window? Are you Jewish? <laughs> it might open the opportunity for you to share your faith, maybe for the first time. No, I, I, I'm not Jewish, but I am grafted in. As Russ would say, we're all Jewish. <laughs> and so uh, that, that, and you can listen on the internet to say how to, hear how to say that, but it's Baruch Ata Adonai Elohenu Melech Holoam Eshir Kedishinu Bimitzvatav Vetiz Vanu Lehadlik Ne Shanaka Hanaka. Baruch Ata Aronai Elohenu, and that goes down to the next one. Melech Ho Holon She Shashe Shi La Ovo Te Nu Bava Yam Ham Bizma Haza. Woohoo! Blessed art you, O Lord God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to kindle the Hanukkah light. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who performed miracles for our forefathers in those days at this time. Light up your light. I, I don't know about you, but I think it's an honor and a privilege for us to celebrate the feast. Uh, we'll be, our next feast will be Passover coming up. We know Christ is the Passover lamb. The whole Passover meal points to Jesus Christ. Hanukkah points to the light that comes into the world. Isn't it great that we have the opportunity to, to celebrate these? And I celebrate Christmas too, so don't get me wrong. I love the Christmas tree and the traditions and, you know, uh, I don't sing. The only Christmas song I don't sing, 
Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. That's kind of worshiping the tree, and that's literally what the pagans did. Uh, do you know there was one monk who observed the pagans at Saturnalia worshiping the evergreen tree and getting ready to dump the Yule log in the flame as the old god dies and their new god comes in the newness of life, and he hung his upside down in protest. Um, because, and then said it, well, anyway, it's a whole story. But anyway, God bless you. Come on up, worship team. And uh, I pray that you have a blessed Hanukkah, and we'll see you Christmas Eve, for those of you that can make it, for a candlelight service at 4 o'clock. What a glorious night. Well, no, no. It, it's, it's, when, it's when Christ came in. She was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and literally became a, 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 a developing embryo. Wait, wait, sorry. I always forget to do this. I've got to, yeah, well, I've got to uh, stop the recording. I am so sorry. Thank you for listening to Staying the Course with Pastor Brett Peterson. If you would like a copy of this message or would like to submit a prayer request or comment, contact us at 949-888-5777 or email us at info at ccbcu.edu. God bless you as you seek and serve him. Remember, stay the course, and we'll see you next week.